last video, we looked at the Loth Hotel, which was at the intersection of Lapeer and 7th Street and Water Street. And we want to continue going down Lapeer Avenue, but before we do that, let's uh, look at that section of road that's missing today, which is Water Street between 7th and 10th. At the intersection where uh, Water Street veers off to the right, uh, just before you get to the 7th Street Bridge, on that corner there, we've looked at this in a previous video when we were doing the, uh, the 7th Street Bridge, but we'll cover it briefly here. This is what was on that corner that I remember uh, going across the 7th Street Bridge many times. I'm not one of the people that stop there very often, or at all actually, but a lot of people have and they really enjoyed their donuts, fixed donuts. But this building used to be a standard gas station and you can see it here at the pump out front. But this is the stripped down version of the gas station. This is what it used to look like originally. The biggest difference being the canopy over the pumps. On the opposite side of the street across from that gas station uh, was this building right here, Port Huron Battery. And uh, I showed you this in the other one. I wasn't going to show it today at all, except that I have another photograph that I didn't have when I did the 7th Street Bridge video. And that's this photo here, which is another gas station, a high-speed gas station. This has been uh, years after that. And if you look closely at this photograph, you can see that uh, the roads were all brick at that time. In this photograph here, they were replacing this, the swing bridge at uh, was at 7th Street uh, with the Basque Bridge. And you can see here as you look uh, into the background, uh, that very tall building on the left is a Metropole Hotel. And then you can see uh, on the right the Loth Hotel. And you can also see the back of the, the gas station uh, here as well. And then the billboards. I think the billboards there for a couple of different reasons. One for advertising and one kind of covered up uh, what I kind of thought was the dilapidated area going from 7th Street to 10th. Uh, there wasn't a lot to see. In this photograph here, you can see the riverside was even worse uh, and left a lot to be desired. But you can see one of the businesses that uh, was on the street, uh, the Port Huron Pattern Works. Across from the Port Huron Pattern Company was the Flinch Ball Electric Company. I have this advertisement here, perhaps even a business card. I'm not too sure I understand what the cartoon is, but I'll, uh, I'll zoom in here and let you be the judge of it. On the north side of Water Street, uh, 723 Water Street to be exact, was the Porcher and Cooperage Works. The business was owned by W.F. Flanagan. This is a great photograph, so let's just take a, a second to look at it. A cooper is someone who made wooden stave vessels, for example, like uh, casks, barrels, buckets, tubs, butter churns, a very important business uh, for the city of Port Huron during that time period, which was in the late 1800s. There were four divisions in the cooper craft. The dry cooper made containers that would be used to ship dry goods, such as cereals, nails, tobaccos, fruits, and vegetables. The dry tight cooper made casts designed to keep dry goods in and moisture out. Gunpowder and flour casts are examples of a dry tight cooper's work. The white cooper made straight stave containers like wash tubs, buckets, and butter churns, which would hold water and other liquids, but did not allow shipping of the liquids. The wet or tight cooper made casts for long-term storage and transportation of liquids that could be under pressure as would beer. And the general cooper worked on ships, on the docks, and in the warehouses and was responsible for cargo while in storage or transit. With a specialized skill, the general cooper could repair a broken stave without losing the contents of a cask. Which is pretty difficult to do, I would imagine. Just a couple doors west from uh, the Porcher and Cooperage show works was the Wells Sawmill. And in the Sanborn map, you can see it, uh, the Black River be uh, at the top. And you can see a creek uh, called Indian Creek that ran adjacent to the sawmill. 
Now, Indian Creek isn't there anymore today. And of course, neither is Water Street, but uh, both of them are gone. But at one time, there was a creek that ran through there and ran through Port Huron. And there was a uh, wooden bridge on Water Street that went over the creek. Here's a more recent map. I'm not sure uh, what the date of this map is, but you can see the creek here as well. And you can see it went down quite a ways uh, into Port Huron. In this illustrated map from 1867, it gives you a real good look at this creek as well. In this satellite view, the red rectangle would represent uh, the mill and the blue line would represent the creek. So that gives you some idea where it would be today if it was still there. I just happened to come across this ad today for the Wells Sawmill. And you can see it's got the owner's name at the top, Fred Wells. And then it says a manufacturing dealer in pine lumber, lath and CNC, whatever CNC is. I found this other part amusing though. I've heard of uh, lumber being sawed to order, but this says bills sawed to order. So maybe they can cut your bill to however you want to pay for it. On just the other side of the creek, uh, on the west side of the creek, C.H. Uh, Jarvis uh, company was there and the sign pretty well explains the business. It was a coal and wood business, supplied a definite need for the citizens of Port Huron for fuel. And uh, that was owned by Charles uh, Jarvis and his wife, Mary. As I was going through my photos today, I came across uh, another photo that had the same picture in it, but I realized then that this first picture I've been showing you is cropped. And this photograph here shows you the whole uh, picture, including his home that was right next to uh, his business. As we work our way up uh, to Water Street, uh, approaching 10th Street, where they uh, intersected was a triangle. And you can see the triangle here at the bottom of the triangle is Crescent Place. And uh, in this photograph here, in this illustrated map, you can see this triangle illustrated by the red and the blue line. The red representing uh, 10th Street and the uh, blue line representing Water Street. And of course, the 10th Street Bridge isn't uh, there yet uh, in this map. At the bottom of the triangle, about where Crescent Street was in the previous map, you can see a factory. This was Home Manufacturing Company. The front of it, uh, front at uh, 10th Street, and the, the back part of the factory was on Water Street. And we have a photograph from this advertisement for Home Manufacturing Company. You can see what the building looked like here, and then Below it, it tells you what they manufactured. I'll let you read this to yourself. Here's another ad I found. There were, uh, it looks like they're doing a little bit of bragging. It says this, interior finish, sash, doors, office and school fixtures, all millwork and cases in Erie Street High School Edition made in our mill. As we look down from the satellite view, you can see what's in this triangle today, a credit union. But when I was growing up, uh, mainly in high school, this is one of my favorite areas because this is where the A&W drive-in was. The A&W was similar to Powers in the respect that it was a place where teens gathered, where they drove their cars through, where they ate, where they took their date. And no, that's not me in the car. But A&W has been around a long time. In June 1919, Roy Allen opened his first root beer stand in Lodi, California. In 1923, A&W began when Allen and Frank Wright opened an A&W drive-in restaurant in Sacramento, California, combining both of their initials for the name and selling the root beer from Allen's stand. A&W became the first franchise restaurant company in 1921, and by their peak in the 1970s had even more stores than McDonald's. This mode of transportation would be more my generation. I don't have a picture of this particular A&W, but they were all pretty similar. They looked a lot like this. It was a place where your friendly car hop would bring your food and drink out to the car, collect her money, and then go back. 
and go to the next car. Check out these prices. Wow, wish we could buy that today for that price. Here you see cheeseburgers and hamburgers and sandwiches. But later on, this would be on the menu. The Papa Burger, the Mama Burger, the Baby Burger, and the Teen Burger. But the main attraction for the NW was the root beer. I didn't realize this, but each franchise made their own root beer right at the site. Of course, they uh, followed a formula, but they still, they put it together and mixed it, and they had a large paddle that they stirred it with, and, and voila, A&W root beer. It was then put into frosted mugs. I think this is part of the charm of an A&W root beer. They then filled those mugs up to the top, and the car hopped, pulled it out to the car, and Boy, it was a taste to remember. For some reason, bottles or cans just don't give you that same taste. Okay, well, there were other businesses that were on Water Street, uh, but I have no pictures of them nor information, so, so let's go back to 7th and Lapeer and uh, Water Street, and uh, we'll go to the south side of Lapeer. We've already looked at what was on the corner here, uh, where the parking lot is now. That's where the Metropole Hotel was and the different businesses that were in it, like the Novelty Company and H.A. Smith. But I didn't have uh, this photograph right here at the time. This was taken much later, but it was also on the corner, and this is the car wash that was there. Gregory's Car Wash, $1.00. So I thought that I would share that with you in this video. Here's the same photograph they used in the Times Herald uh, introducing their grand opening. And I'll let you read this at your leisure. All right, let's go on to the next building. When Google took this photograph, it was the active lounge. There's many businesses in this uh, building over the years, but the only one I have a picture of is this one here, which was taken probably in the late 1800s. The tall hotel you see in the corner is now a parking lot, and then this would be the building where you just saw the photograph of the active lounge. And as you can see in this photograph, it was a general hardware store. Still the same building, but you don't have the crown on top of the roof anymore. As we zoom out a little bit here, you can see that tall building a couple of doors west. This was the Independent Order of Oddfellows Hall, or to shorten the title a little bit, the Oddfellows Hall. Or to shorten it even more, I-O-O-F. As you can see from this Google map shot, the building is still there today. And as you can see, today it houses Victoria's Hair Studio. And at one time it housed Carl Henry's Barber Shop. Thanks to some photographs by Laurie Schaefer Bryce, we're able to get a little closer look at this building. Here we see the, the cornerstone, which uh, is a little bit different because it has two dates on it. I tried to research and see exactly what this meant. And the closest I could come to it was that uh, it could be from two different calendars, like the Masons used to use. Now, whether that's the case here or not, I don't know. I just think it's kind of odd, but then, again, it is the Odd Fellows Hall. There's no doubt that this building was an Odd Fellows Hall because it's very well marked. If you look at the very top of the building, you can see the uh, IOOF uh, above that window. And then if you go down uh, to the bottom in the entryway, you can see the I-O-O-F is still spelled out uh, in the tile. I believe this building to be the most ornate building on the block. On the third floor, these windows have been covered up now, but at one time, these were beautiful, big, large windows with rounded tops. And the second floor windows have been replaced. These windows were much larger at one time as well. The spent block work looks a little dull now, but I bet if it were sandblasted, it would really stand out. I think in his glory days, it was a beautiful building. All right, that's it for this video. Join me in our next video and see what there is to see.